So to start us off, we are very, very happy uh, to have one of the most influential researchers in asset pricing and competition, uh, Ralph Kojan from University of Chicago booth. And he will give us introductory remarks and set the stage for today's topic. Uh, Ralph, uh, I'll turn it over to you now and you have 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thanks so much uh, um, for the kind of work. So, so can you see my screen? Yes, great. Okay, well, thanks so much for um, for the opportunity to provide some uh, opening comments. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, so what I will do is I will sort of like try to give a little bit of perspective from my view in terms of like where demand system asset pricing fits in, um, in sort of standard macro finance and asset pricing. Um, then I'll think a little bit about sort of like under what conditions um, does data on, on portfolio holdings, which is what we're going to sort of look at today, sort of like does it sort of like add additional information and then I'll touch on sort of like, like a, a series of questions in different literatures where I think demand system asset pricing could, could, could be useful. So, so just to get started, um, when we think about sort of like what we typically do in, in asset pricing and macro finance, then given like investors' preferences and endowments technology and so on, asset pricing models imply asset demand curves. And then we impose market clearing and outcome, outcome asset prices. So in, in a way, like all of asset pricing is, is demand-based demand -based asset pricing. Now, once we bring those models to the data though, like econometric tests sort of what they typically do is they connect asset prices to, to state variables and, and their innovations to see like which shocks are priced uh, and which sort of like which state variables capture fluctuations in investment opportunities. And so, so what, what the goal is I think of demand system asset pricing is to also in addition match uh, data on investor level portfolio holdings. Okay, and I wanna emphasize that this idea of using portfolio holdings is actually not new at all. Um, so if you go back to the 60s and I don't know, to 80s, there was actually a very sort of active literature with contributions by Brainerd, Frankel, uh, Friedman, and Dobin, among others, that used demand systems to, to, um, to study some of, these, some of these questions. Now, it may be useful to take a step back and sort of think, well, what were sort of like the, the obstacles in the early literature and why is now a particularly good time to revisit that approach? And so I think there's like at least three reasons. First was sort of very limited high quality data on portfolio holdings. And I think what the two papers today illustrate is that we now have a wealth on, on, of, of data on institutional holdings across countries, across asset classes. Um, and sort of excitingly also now we sort of learn more about sort of the, the household sector and what their portfolio holdings look like. And I think that's extremely valuable. Secondly, so if you look at sort of the kinds of models that, that the earlier literature estimated is they were like very, very flexible. So you think of like, think of like a vector of portfolio holdings that were then explained by, um, by expected returns and, and other variables and there were lots of parameters. And so what sort of like the, 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 the recent literature does is to, to really use like factor models and, and, and use this characteristics based demand system to sort of like, like make this much more parsimonious and more tractable to estimate. And then the third sort of like, like obstacle in the early literature, I think, was identification. So if you look at the econometric tools that were used, it was either I don't know, simply OLS or, 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 or additional restrictions being imposed. And so what you see there is that, that sort of the estimates that they got were quite, um, um, quite unstable, unidentified. And if you impose like additional restrictions like mean variance preferences, then you're really sort of like imposing a lot of restrictions on substitution patterns, which are quite important. And so in recent years, we've seen a lot of sort of like, like creative new instruments that, that have been proposed in the literature. And of course, a lot more work can be done there. Um, but at least I think we have more reliable estimates than, than what we used to have. Okay, and so given all that, it seems sort of natural to revisit that, that approach and to see what we can learn from that. Now, what I wanna do then is sort of, sort of think about sort of like under what conditions do we actually learn something from holdings data beyond prices and, and macro variables and, and characteristics? And for what kind of questions are our demand systems uh, potentially useful? And then like what, what kind of like, like lessons can we learn for, for theory? And so let me start with the first with the first question. So when do holdings data contain additional information? So I'm gonna impose a little bit of structure just to sort of like, like, like make, that, make that point. So consider like a demand curve of investor I. So QI is my demand for like a given stock or, or the market, um, um, uh, whatever you, you, you prefer. Um, think of QI bar sort of like your average sort of like demand for a particular stock if you're in steady state. Now a little QI is sort of the demand deviation. Think of it as like rebalancing in response to new information and prices. And so, so QI over here is gonna to respond to prices. Zeta over here is the demand elasticity, okay? And so the second paper today is gonna sort of think very carefully about how to model that demand elasticity. 
UI is a demand shock that tells you something about sort of expected future growth. It could be sentiment, risk preferences, any of those, any of those forces. And so, so you impose market clearing. So the size weighted average of demand across all investors has to be equal to zero for every buyer there's, there's a seller. And out of this simple structure, two equations come that are, that are sort of useful to look at for a second to understand when portfolio holdings could be useful. So the first one is that price changes or returns are equal to those demand shocks scaled by that elasticity. And the demand of a given investor, uh, the rebalancing of a given investor is that investor's demand shock relative to the size weighted average demand shock of all the other, all the other investors. Now, that elasticity in standard models data over here is like really, really high. And so what that implies is that demand shocks, which are equal to that elasticity times returns has to be like really volatile. Okay. The second sort of uh, observation is that in the data, portfolio holdings don't change all that much from one period to the next. And I'm gonna revisit that in, in a second. Now, what does that mean? Is that if, if this aggregate demand shock is very volatile, but the left-hand side here is not very volatile, it means that sort of like, like investors kind of have to agree on, on demand shocks. And so that means that investors have to agree on, on, on um, unexpected growth rates, shocks to risk preferences, things like that. And so in that case, if, if, if these demand shocks are virtually the same, looking at price, at, at, at price changes or any information from holdings contains very little additional information. Now, what is sort of then critical is to get a feeling for like what Zeta or what the demand elasticity actually is empirically. And so to here, I'm gonna sort of draw a little bit on the work that, that Moto Yogo and I did. Um, and sort of we documented two facts, which I think are, are underlying the, the elasticity estimates that the literature has, has found. First of all, portfolio holdings, as I mentioned, are not particularly volatile. And so you can see that like characteristics are changes, prices are changing, but portfolio holdings don't respond all that, all that much. Now that in and of itself may be fine. There's lots of models where there's like no rebalancing whatsoever. But then there's a second fact that seems to sort of like, like um, be perhaps more challenging, which is that if you look at the portfolios, they actually deviate a lot from the market portfolio. So a typical institution holds something like 60 stocks, the weights that they hold are very different from, from, from standard market weights. And so that looks very active, but then in response to changes in investment opportunities, they're not rebalancing their portfolios all that, all that much. Okay, and that's sort of like suggested that perhaps demand is more inelastic. Now, of course, there's like a lot of work on, on formal estimates of, of demand elasticities. And so I'm gonna sort of put it as price impact, so one over the elasticity. And, and I'm gonna sort of, as a point of reference, think about sort of like what theory implies as, as well. And so, so if you go to like the level of individual stocks, then you see that that theory predicts a price impact that's essentially essentially zero. If you go to the, to the, to the data, then the estimates, so sort of they vary a, a, across papers, across methodologies, but order of magnitude, you can think about like, like price impact of being one or slightly, slightly higher. And so, so that's sort of like a deviation from standard theories of like several orders of magnitude. Now with that lower elasticity or higher price impact, starting to look at uh, sort of like, if you start looking at, at demand, there's like additional information in there. You can also look at the level of factors and sort of what theory predicts is that like if, 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 if any two investments are like less close substitutes, then price impact should be, should be higher. And consistent with that, sort of like what the recent literature finds is that if you compare like let's say like 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 value versus size and, and things like that you get price impact measures that are order of magnitude higher like or substantially higher like order of magnitude like five and so that means that if you buy one percent of a given factor you're going to move prices by five percent you can also lift it to the level of the aggregate market again standard models are very elastic so that means that the price impact that you estimate or that, that the model suggests you uh, you should find is something like one over 20. Empirically, you see that those estimates again are substantially higher. Different countries, different methodologies, but again, far from what theories predict. Now that's sort of like an important upside of that. So that means that if markets are indeed sort of like inelastic, then you can sort of extract additional information from portfolio holdings beyond simply looking at prices. Okay, and so understanding like, like the metrics of different groups of investors becomes like a meaningful, a meaningful exercise. Okay, so with that in hand, so let me sort of like, like, like run through like a, a, a series of questions where I think demand systems could potentially be, be useful. So the first um, uh, area where I think sort of like using demand systems would be, would be valuable is in, in the area of, of belief. So there was a whole, I don't know, 
earlier mini conference on on the topic of beliefs, which is which is sort of very exciting. A lot of new work on that. What you could do sort of in that context is think about sort of like like what we currently do is we look at sort of survey expectations coming from analysts or from households, and then directly connect those to to prices. What you could do is you could ask the question like, okay, if there's different components. In, in, in the beliefs data, like how do they sort of like show up in, in, in the holdings data and to what extent are different investors paying attention to, to different analysts or share the, same, share the same views. And so that sort of like relates to the recent sort of like literature on the path through beliefs to actions, like so the interesting work by Stefano Giglio, uh, Matteo Maggiore and Johanna Strobel, where they sort of like find that the path through from beliefs to action seems to be quite, quite muted. Okay, now, in order to then get back to prices, one of the things that could be happening is that you have like, like a weak path through from, from, from beliefs to actions, but if those like smaller demand shocks like hit inelastic markets, it could still move prices quite, quite a bit. Okay, and so sort of like understanding sort of like, the, sort of like how we go from beliefs to prices seems like an interesting sort of direction to explore. The second sort of like, like area where demand systems could be valuable is in, is in the asset management, the questions related to the asset management industry. And so we've seen large changes in the structure there. And the second paper today is sort of like a great example of, 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 of just that. Okay, so we see the rise of passive investing and we want to understand what does that do to the structure of the market. Similarly, there's a lot of like recent work on, on ESG investing, big shift in quantities, and we can explore sort of like how that impacts, impacts prices and, and expected returns. The third area where I think demand systems could be could be valuable is is in fixed income markets. So obviously, sort of like there's lots of quantity questions, sort of like in that in that literature. But currently, we're looking largely at largely at prices. I think. And so, for instance, in the context of unconventional monetary policy, if central banks sort of change either the amount of like long term or short term uh, bonds that it's holding, then the question is like how are investors substituting away from those from those securities, and how does it influence influence prices? At lower frequencies, there's of course a lot of discussion about sort of the decline in real interest rates. Um, and some of the stories that are being sort of discussed or some of the theories that have been proposed relate to demand from like, 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 like emerging economies and maybe sort of coming demand from like wealthy investors. And again, sort of like understanding quantitatively like how powerful these effects are, assuming sort of, or using sort of like recent elasticity estimates seems like a useful, a useful exercise. Now on the flip side, so that sort of interest rate declining, there's also a very active debate on, on fiscal capacity and debt valuation puzzles, where some are arguing that some of the fiscal variables that should matter for the valuation of government debt, the government debt are not sufficiently, sufficiently reflected in those, in those prices. By sort of like decomposing the valuations of, of government debt at the investor level or by different countries, you can sort of explore like, like which investors are not responding enough or at least responding in a different way compared to our theories um, to those to those variables. Okay, and again, if you then sort of like have that model and it sort of matches reasonable substitution patterns, you can also revisit questions about about fiscal fiscal capacity. The last area that I'll briefly mention where I think demand systems could be valuable is in the context of international finance. And so this again is an example where, like, if you think about the whole literature on convenience yields or the special demand for U.S. assets or dollar-denominated assets. Um, there's lots of like price effects that we that we know, but of course it would be interesting to understand sort of like who's driving that convenience yield, like which investors in which in which countries are there certain sectors that are are responsible for that, and again sort of I think sort of having um, building out sort of demand systems in a global context could be valuable as as well. The last one that I'll mention is sort of the exchange rate disconnect, where like a growing literature adds like demand shocks. Uh, to explain fluctuations in exchange rates beyond, beyond fundamentals. Now, once you sort of like bring in, bring in portfolio holdings data, you can actually measure those demand shocks, understand its properties, like what, are, what is the correlation structure of those demand shocks, how persistent are they, and then we can actually calibrate those, um, those international macro models to actual, to actual data, and hopefully that sort of like guides, guides future, future work. Okay, so let me... Um, just as a, as a last slide, sort of like, like talk a little bit about, about asset pricing theory or macro finance theory. So I think sort of the new facts that have been documented sort of like, like um, uh, raise like a lot of interesting questions. So first of all, like we don't really know why demand is so inelastic. Um, and so in the paper with Xavier, uh, Gebex, we sort of explored some of these, um, but I think there's a lot more to be done. So 
It could be related to like institutional mandates. It could be like inertia, perhaps regulation plays a role. It could be risk constraints. Perhaps it's agency frictions. Perhaps it's very hard to estimate expected returns. And so I don't really know how much expected returns change. I'm not gonna change my portfolio all that, all that much. All of those are, are reasonable possibilities. And truly understanding why investors don't seem to respond very much to prices is, is an important question. Secondly, once you have sort of like, like once we sort of like think of, of inelastic markets, then so the demand sorts of different groups of investors become, become interesting. So instead of having like one big shock that moves everything up and down, we can now kind of unbundle that shock in a meaningful way and try to understand how demand sorts of different groups of investors start to start to matter. And so in it, we can hope and I hope hope to have some 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 way of like unbundling the dark matter and asset pricing and really go to the investor level and, and learn what what drives their uh, their demand shocks and, and flows. And then lastly, I think it's important to sort of develop these frameworks sort of like in, in, in a more dynamic dynamic setting, like, like the elasticity estimates that I showed you before, some of those are at fairly high frequencies, they use daily data, some of them use quarterly data. And so understanding how fast and slow traders interact, how important is inertia and things like that are like very meaningful questions, I think. And that, of course, goes back to like the research agenda that Daryl Duffy set out to uh, to explore in his presidential address and sort of like combining that with like realistic sort of like elasticity estimates, I think is very is a very exciting direction to, to go as well. And so I know from my perspective, given the wealth of new data that we have on holdings, new methods that we have, um, we can start to sort of like apply demand systems like across countries and across across asset classes and, and hopefully sort of learn a lot of new a lot of new facts and, and develop then new theories consistent with those with those facts. And I think the two papers today are like really fantastic examples of like what, what one can do with that uh, and hopefully more to, more to follow. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Ralph, for the very insightful uh, introduction. And Tarun, uh, now I uh, pass it on to you. You have 30 minutes. Okay, I'm assuming you can see my slides. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. And here we go, super. So thanks very much for uh, giving me the chance to be a part of this very exciting session. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Vimal Balasubramaniam, who's at Queen Mary, uh, John Campbell, uh, who I believe is here, uh, and Ben Ranish at the Fed Board, who I believe is also attending the presentation. Um, so uh, the portfolio, this, uh, this, this paper begins with, uh, with, with sort of looking into the question of why portfolios are heterogeneous across investors. And in particular, we're, we're gonna focus on households or retail investors in this paper. Now, if you go back to the sort of venerable old CAPM, the, the model predicts that all investors should hold the same risky portfolio, but diluting it with different amounts of cash. Uh, but we know that this isn't actually true. And you know, even if you sort of wanted to push the boat out a little bit further into KFON separation, uh, this is really far from the truth when you confront uh, the data with these predictions. And so there's been a whole range of different theories that people have put forward to explain why this might be the case. There's obviously theories based on heterogeneous financial circumstances. So there may be different degrees of non-traded income uh, across investors. It may be that investors have different investment horizons, meaning that the hedging demands look different, or it may be that liquidity needs differ across investors. Uh, another class of explanations that doesn't have to do with heterogeneous financial circumstances has more to do with information, beliefs, or preferences that can differ across the set of investors. And so here there's lots and lots of work. I'm just putting down a few sorts of classes of these explanations here. It could be that there are differences in familiarity, return expectations, and as Ralph mentioned, there's an emerging literature on ESG preferences uh, at the moment, of which there are two examples, including one of Harrison's papers. Now, there's a lot of theories, but it turns out that the evidence is a little bit more scattered. Um, and so if we really wanted to, to sort of take a little bit more of a careful look at these theories, we need to find a way to parsimoniously characterize all of this heterogeneity across the entire cross-section of investors. And so what that's going to require, especially when it comes to dealing with fairly granular portfolio data, is to put some structure on the problem to characterize this evidence on household ownership and on portfolio construction. Now, of course, there's a big literature on the drivers of retail trading, which has been very influential, but this is distinct from that um, and sort of is really trying to think about the determinants of portfolio construction. And so that's the question that motivates this paper, hence the title, which is 
We start with the question of what, which is if you were to take stocks and then describe them as a list of characteristics, which of those characteristics have heterogeneous clientels? That is to say, are there some characteristics along the dimensions of which you can split investors and say, some people really like this characteristic and other people seem to really avoid this characteristic in their portfolios. The second part of this is to ask, once you had a good characterization of what, which is these clientels, which is who are these clientels? So if you were to describe a set of investor attributes, uh, which investor attributes can you connect to these particular sets of stock characteristic clientels? And in particular, we're going to also then try to group stock characteristics into clusters to try to come up with a more parsimonious summary of the evidence. So now there are a number of challenges facing us in this task. Uh, there's a conceptual challenge, which is we need to find a way to characterize a very big sparse holdings matrix that records the holdings of N stocks uh, by H households. And N and H are both very large. So in, in our empirical application, we are looking at about 3,100 odd stocks. And we have close to 10 million investors in the cross section that we study in the data. And so this is a big matrix and it's also a sparse matrix because of course, not every, not every investor holds every stock. And of course, uh, as Ralph referred to in his introductory remarks, there's measurement challenges as well, which is that the data for this has not been available very easily. Household surveys rarely ask about individual stocks that households hold. Brokerage firm data don't often capture the complete portfolios uh, of investors. And in other environments where we do have more granular data, like in Scandinavia, for example, there are both intermediate and direct holdings. This doesn't pose a, a conceptual problem, but it turns out that you can you know, sort of get tangled up in the details of complicating the interpretation of direct holdings, which is ultimately what we're after in this case. So the responses that we have in this paper to both of those challenges are that we have a conceptual response where we draw an analogy that turns out to be extremely useful, which is that if you were to think about the N by H holdings matrix, focusing on a single cross section of the data, that is to say a single point in time, then you can view that holdings matrix that documents the holdings of N assets by H investors in a way that is analogous to the N by T return matrix R that records the returns of N stocks over T different time periods. And it turns out that if you adopt that analogy, you can run fairly far with this and employ a very rich set of ideas from time series factor analysis that have been used to characterize the N by N covariance matrix of stock returns to look at the N by N co-holdings matrix of, uh, of the way that investors hold stocks. Now, of course, you need to adapt this methodology for the cross-sectional context that we're looking at, because obviously H is much, much larger than the time dimension that has been considered in the cross-sectional returns analysis. And what's more, the diagonal elements of these matrices matter a lot because it turns out that there's extreme heteroscedasticity in holdings, which is unlike that that you normally see in returns. The measurement response that we have is that we go to India where we have comprehensive electronic records of monthly household level stock ownership. Um, and this is at the stock level as well as transactions. And we see these data over roughly a decade from 2002 to 2011. And using, uh, you know, in these data, you can see all direct stock holdings of investors, uh, which are aggregated by their tax identification numbers. And what's more, over the period that we study, the mutual fund share is minimal, which means that the complexities of interpretation of direct and indirect holdings simultaneously don't really exist to, the, to a large extent uh, in, in what we're looking at. Now, let me just preview what we find and then I'll get into the details of what we're studying here and how our, uh, our sort of techniques work. So the what we find is that the strongest characteristic clientels, the things that separate investors into different types of groups are along the dimensions of stock age. Some people really like young stocks and other people really like old stocks. Dividend paying, uh, payingness of a stock. Some people really like stocks that pay dividends and other people uh, avoid them and share price. People seem to like high share price or low share price stocks, even controlling for things like market capitalization. It's also the case that in India, there are business groups kind of like chai balls in Korea, which connect large sets of firms into bigger business groups. And that seems to matter a lot for clientele effects as do past returns for stocks and the turnover or liquidity of stocks. But it turns out that pharma friend styles like book to market and size have relatively weaker clientels overall. But when you look into the cross-section of investor attributes, you can find some interesting patterns here. 
And if we were to just parsimoniously summarize what we find, we find that older accounts seem to hold old and established stocks. Large accounts hold dividend paying growth stocks that have had high past returns. High turnover accounts seem to hold lottery like stocks, which are small, low share prices, have high turnover volatility and skewness. And if you look at single stock accounts, extremely under diversified accounts that only hold one stock in their entire account, they seem to hold young stocks with high share prices and low volatility. These are like mega IPOs essentially, uh, and they sort of stick with them. And then in the very end, uh, turning back to some of the questions that sort of motivated the introductory remarks, we try to relate these co-holdings to stock returns, in particular to the variances and covariances of stock returns. And we find that characteristics that are correlated uh, in terms of their returns uh, also have high co-holdings. And this suggests to us that there are investor clientele effects on returns. And we show using an auxiliary analysis that it doesn't seem to be uh, squaring with optimal diversification motives on the part of investors. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about the data and then I will uh, work through our methodology and then show you a few facts about co-holdings and returns at the very end. So the data are comprehensive electronic records of uh, ownership uh, at the stock level aggregated by the tax identification number. Uh, these data uh, go from 2002 to 2011, but what we'll do in this particular paper is just to focus on August 2011, uh, where you have 3,103 stocks and 9.6 million retail investors. And yet again, we observe individual stocks in these portfolios, uh, not just the risky share, and Primarily, these are direct stock holdings rather than indirect stock holdings. So what do we observe about these accounts uh, and about the portfolios of these investors? We can see uh, a set of characteristics. They're not very detailed demographic characteristics because of the confidential nature of the data that we've been given. But what we can see is the age and months of the account, the size of the account, the account turnover over the past 12 months, the number of stocks they hold, the number of stocks they traded in the past 12 months, and some geographical information for zones, north, south, east, west, and, uh, and west of India. The portfolio attributes that we see are much more detailed. We can observe the share price of the stocks held, their age, the realized volatility of these stocks, their book to market, market cap, and so on and so forth, uh, all the way out to characteristics like business groups, uh, for example, and we sort of group that into, into 10 different groups, uh, which are the largest ones in the data. Now, what we're gonna do in the rest of this analysis is to take stock characteristics and then just turn them into ranks. So we're gonna rank stock characteristics between minus 0 0.5, that is the lowest ranked on the attribute, for example, on market capitalization, that would be the smallest stock, and 0.5 would be the largest stock with zero at the median rank. And we're just gonna evaluate these within each household's portfolio by using portfolio weights in most of our analysis that I'm gonna show you today. So if you were to look at these account attributes of these 9.6 million, uh, million investors, on average, we're looking at people who have been in the market for 61 months or roughly five years. They have an account size on average of about $11,500, but you can see that there's considerable cross-sectional variation with some very small accounts and some very large accounts. But if you were to multiply that by the ratio of per capita GDP in the US to India, the distribution of these account sizes lies pretty closely on top of the SCF distribution in the US. So if you're worried about external validity, then perhaps that's a bit more reassuring for you. The turnover of these accounts is about 38% on average. They hold about 8.45 stocks on average, but again, there's a lot of cross-sectional variation. And the number of stocks that they trade on average is about five in the past 12 months. If you look into the portfolios and you look at the portfolio attributes uh, of these portfolios, these are the tilts on various of these uh, various stock characteristics. So to give you an example, if market capitalization runs between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5, on average, the households, which we're studying in our data, we're not looking at institutional investors in this study, although we do have access to that data as well. These households are basically holding larger stocks that are close to the largest stocks that we can see, which are at the level of 0.5. But the thing that's really interesting here is not these average tilts, it's the cross-sectional variation in these tilts. And this really is our measure of clientele effects put differently. So for example, if we were to look at stock age, this has a very high cross-sectional standard deviation of this attribute across investor portfolios, 
And you can see at the 10th uh, percentile of the distribution, they're holding extremely young stocks. And at the 90th percentile of the distribution, they're holding extremely large stocks. And so this is really our measure of clientele effects, which is which ones of these characteristics allow us to really separate investors into these different types of groups. Okay. So what stock characteristics have clientels? We're gonna formalize that analysis slightly more. In order to do that, I'm gonna to have to introduce a little bit of notation. So going back to time series factor models in that analogy, stocks run from one to N and time runs from one to T. And those are the two dimensions you consider in that type of analysis. In this case, the additional dimension is investors, which we call households indexed by H from one to cap H. We're gonna collapse T to a single time period in this case. Actually, uh, one of the things that Ralph said resonates in this data, which is that holdings are very persistent uh, in this context. So this turns out not to be a huge consideration for what we do. So we're only gonna work with August, 2011, and then we're gonna work across the dimensions of I and H. Now Q for quantum of holdings is an N by H holdings matrix, which has a set of vectors in it, one for each household. Uh, and so you're gonna have a set of column vectors, H column vectors, one for each household that lists the stocks that they hold. And so N of those elements are going to contain zeros where the household doesn't hold the stock, and it's gonna contain the portfolio weight in our main analysis for when the household does hold the stock. So there's gonna be lots and lots of zeros and a few populated uh, portfolio weights in these QH holdings vectors. And we're just gonna stack all of them. And of course, if you look al uh, along the rows, you can just see which households hold any given stock as well, which is what you can call the investor vector. Now this N by H holdings matrix is quite helpful because what we can do is, we can basically take the outer product of this matrix with itself once we demeaned it. And you can really think about this as exactly analogous to the empirical covariance matrix of stock returns. And given our choice of portfolio weights, it's positive semi-definite and all of that good stuff, just like the covariance matrix of stock returns. What's in this matrix? The diagonal elements of this co-holdings matrix, which is an N by N matrix, like the N by N covariance matrix of stock returns, captures on the diagonals the variability across investors of individual stock holdings, and the off diagonals capture the covariability across investors of individual stock holdings, which is essentially representing the average propensity for stocks to be held together in portfolios. And that's really quite important. So you've got the off diagonal elements here, which are very important, and you've also got the on diagonal elements. Now, of course, given the extreme heteroscedasticity of holdings, the diagonal elements are going to matter a lot here. Um, which is unlike the stock returns context where the covariance matrix, the off diagonal elements are much more important than the on diagonal elements. Now, once again, if we were to just think about the cross-sectional variance of the average characteristic tilt in invest investors' portfolios on any given characteristic, that is what we call characteristic clientele strength. So for example, Suppose we were to take the average or the market capitalization tilt of every single household and then just take its cross-sectional variance. If that cross-sectional variance is high, then some investors are holding very large stocks and other investors are holding very small stocks in their portfolios. And we would say that size has a very strong clientele strength. But it turns out that that measure of uh, the empirical variance of that characteristic tilt across households is actually connected to this co-holdings matrix. In fact, it's just C prime co-holdings matrix times C. Now, why is that helpful? It's because that then allows us to take that clientele strength measure and ask, does it come from the diagonal elements or the off diagonal elements? The diagonal elements tell you whether there's wide variation in the holdings of stocks with extreme characteristic values and the off diagonal element contribution to the total clientele strength tells you whether co-held stocks have similar extreme characteristic values in their portfolios. Now, in the di in, now, back to the time series context, the diagonal elements are generally much, much lower than the off-diagonal elements, but that's not true here because you have sparse holdings and extreme variability in holdings intensity across different stocks. Now, I should also mention here that obviously you're going to have that these uh, characteristic rank vectors from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 are gonna be highly correlated across different characteristics. So size might be correlated with share price, might be correlated with other things. So we need to adopt an orthogonalization procedure in order to make those things look independent enough. And that's one of the things that we do here. 
So back to why we're doing this, we say that a stock characteristic has a strong clientele effect if the average characteristic is highly variable across investor portfolios. And so we're weighting all investors equally. So these measures are representative of a typical investor, but we can also do this for valuated portfolios or portfolios ranked by their extent of diversification or anything you like. And we do some of those things in the paper. And this is analogous to the time series literature on factor returns that says that a characteristic represents an important risk if long short characteristic portfolio based on that characteristic has a high return variance. And so there's this nice paper by Kozak Nagel and Santosh that talks about that. So what does this look like in the data when we just compute these measures across all these orthogonalized characteristics? So in the data, as you can see here, we find that stock age is the one that has the greatest cross-sectional variance. Uh, and so this is the one that we think has the highest, based on our measure, characteristic clientele strength in the data. This is followed by whether a stock is a dividend payer or not. It's followed by the share price of the stock that also seems to separate people a lot turnover and so on and so forth. But you have to go really far down in order to see things like book to market, market capitalization or beta, which is what traditionally speaking, the, the pharma French factors are sort of based on, right? So now the other question is, you know, how much of this is coming from the diagonal contribution versus the off diagonal contribution? In all of the data, you can see that the diagonal elements are really factoring in a lot, which is the variability of the holdings across investors. But you can still see that in some of these cases, the co-holdings is also contributing something to clientele strength. So, you know, for example, share price, okay, is something where people will hold lots of share, high share price things together in their portfolios or hold lots of low share price stocks together in their portfolios. Okay, so having sort of done this, this, basic, uh, this basic look at the data, the next thing we wanna do is to really start getting a little bit more focused on organizing the data. So we're gonna look at stock characteristic clusters to ask whether investors hold particular groups of characteristics together. So in order to do this, we compress the N dimension, which is the dimension of stocks into a set of characteristic tilts by just defining from the N by H uh, matrix of, of stock holdings. What we're going to do is define a K by H matrix for K different characteristic tilts. So for each investor, we're gonna compute their average characteristic tilt on each one of these different characteristics, share price, age, and so on and so forth and just list K of them for every single uh, investor, okay? So this is gonna be measured as the average characteristic tilt for all observed stock characteristics. Now, of course, these things are orthogonalized, again, because you know it has to be the case. Otherwise, you might just see that all of these Ks look identical uh, for each H, but we're, we're, we're gonna orthogonalize them relative to each other. And then what we'll do is, we're gonna have a K by K characteristic co-holdings matrix, which is like the N, N by N co-holdings matrix, but now at the level of characteristics, and then just extract principal components of this to turn investor preferences into these orthogonalized basic basis vectors. And so let me just show you what we do and, and what these characteristic clusters look like in the data. Okay, so this is these are the characteristics. These are the nine characteristics we consider, stock age, dividend payingness, stock turnover, realized volatility, share price, and so on. So what are the top three principal components that come out of this analysis? The first one, PC1, is essentially telling you that it's old stocks, it's high on stock age, which, have, which pay dividends, have high turnover, and have high realized volatility in the past. And it doesn't really seem to load up on any of the other characteristics here. The second thing that sort of organizes characteristics in terms of their clusters uh, that people hold in the data is young high turnover stocks with low share prices. Okay, you can see that here, high returns and skewness. And so these are lottery-like stocks. And then the third principal component is essentially dividend paying stocks, which are growth stocks uh, sorry, where's the, there we are, growth stocks with market beta, with low beta, high turnover, okay, uh, sorry, low turnover and high returns. Okay, so that's PC3. So, so these are the sort of three groups that we detect, old established stocks, lottery-like stocks, and dividend paying growth stocks with low beta, low turnover and high past returns. Now, who holds these, these different stock characteristic clusters in the data, which represent the, the primary uh, source of variance in this characteristic co-holdings matrix? Well, we can just do simple univariate regressions 
because each portfolio now can be represented as PC1, PC2, or PC3. So you just take all of the PC1 on all of the characteristic tilts, and now you can, you can, I can just tell you what is the PC1-ness of this portfolio, the PC2-ness, or the PC3-ness, and we can just simply regress them on a set of account attributes, which are along here, the size of the account, the number of stocks that are held by the account, the age, and so on and so forth. And what you start to see pretty quickly is that larger accounts hold old established stocks and dividend paying growth stocks, but they don't hold young lottery like stocks in the data. And then those patterns look fairly similar for, for accounts that have high diversification, lots of stocks in their portfolios. Again, they hold PC1 and PC3, but they don't as much hold PC2. And you can see that older accounts are again holding old established stocks, dividend paying growth stocks, and they're avoiding young lottery like stocks. What accounts look different? High turnover accounts look very different. They seem to like young lottery-like stocks and they avoid dividend-paying growth stocks. And you can see that stocks that own that accounts that only have a single stock in them, extremely under-diversified accounts, seem to have uh, very low holdings of old established stocks. In fact, they're going for young, not very established stocks. Uh, they're going for non-dividend-paying value stocks, uh, and they also like young lottery-like stocks to an extent. And so this really kind of summarizes the data that we have here. If you don't like the analysis at the level of these uh, principal components, what we also have here is an ability to tell you who owns what characteristics by going directly into the characteristic holdings matrix. And again, along the rows here, you've got attributes of the account, size, number of stocks, age, turnover, whether they're located in the south, the west, or the north of the country. And then here again, you've got these characteristic attributes also orthogonalized. And we're not doing univariate regressions anymore here. We're doing multiple regressions where we're going to take stock age tilt of the account and then regress it on a whole set of account attributes. These are the adjusted R squares of each one of these regressions uh, along the bottom over here. And what you can see is you can start building up a picture that's a little bit no more nuanced about what people are holding. I'm just going to summarize that for you here. Um, which Karun, you have five more minutes. Okay, sure which is that older accounts hold old, small, low, low turnover value stocks with high returns. Large accounts hold old, small, high share price, dividend paying growth stocks with high returns. High turnover accounts hold essentially lottery like stocks and single stock accounts hold what we call mega IPOs, young stocks with high share price and low volatility. Now, yet again, you can go even deeper into the analysis if you wanted to and go down to a level of granularity of individual stocks we do that in the paper. I'm not going to have too much time to talk about that right now. But essentially what you can do is you can just run a factor model where you explain the portfolio weights of any given household H on any given stock I by using a range of different account attributes, which we call factors here, which vary across households. But you can also do things like throw in attributes of the portfolio. So for example, does, you know, if I take a particular small stock, is it the case that holding other small stocks in the portfolio, or the average size of the stocks in the portfolio, tells me about the propensity to hold this particular small stock? And of course, since there's all of this sparsity, we need to do this using leave out estimation. So it tends to be a little bit more cumbersome. So anytime I'm going to use the portfolio weight here, I won't use it in the construction of the factor on the right hand side. Okay. And yet again, a useful factor helps to explain cross-sectional dispersion in household stock holdings with dispersion and loadings being quite important. Okay, so here we find uh, another set of results, account attribute factors uh, that sort of confirm what we find, portfolio attributes like market capitalization, share price, dividend paying, and stock change have dispersed loadings and so on. And of course, industry and business group factors play a role, not, typically not acknowledged in the literature. Now, in the last couple of minutes that I have, I just want to quickly tell you about how we connect uh, these, uh, these observations on co-holdings to returns. So what we do is something very simple. This is regressions with nine observations and 36 observations. Of course, we can use the full power of the cross-section and what we do, but this is actually quite instructive in showing us what's happening. So the dependent variable here is essentially just the variances of return factors on nine different characteristics. So you can really think about this as, for example, if it's size, if I have a portfolio that is basically weighting stocks by their size, and I put that into a portfolio and I measure the variance of that portfolio, I can do that for nine different characteristics. And now I've got the return variances of these nine portfolios, hence the nine observations 
on the left hand side. Now, if I put on the right hand side our clientele strength measure, it turns out that at first glance, it looks like nothing's going on. There's no, no relationship between these things. But as soon as we start to split apart that clientele strength indicator into the diagonal contribution and the off diagonal contribution, which I talked about earlier, now you start to see some interesting patterns. Okay, essentially, greater variability, there is greater variability in holdings associated with less volatile characteristics. Widely held stocks, in particular, uh, tend to be less volatile. And so that's what's coming out of this diagonal element. But that's not really as interesting as what's happening on the off diagonal element. What that's telling you is that stocks that tend to be held together in portfolios, or in this case, characteristics that tend to be held together in portfolios, actually seem to have higher variance on average. Okay, So the return variance of particular characteristics associated with particular characteristics is actually higher for stock or for characteristics that tend to be co-held in portfolios. You can also do a covariance matrix of this nine by nine covariance matrix of these return factor portfolios, and then just look at the the lower triangular uh, elements of that matrix, the 36 uh, uh, observations. And basically what you see here is again, that characteristics that tend to be co-held in portfolios together also tend to co-move in terms of their returns, okay? So this is actually pointing again in the direction of something to do with equilibrium asset pricing here. We don't think it has to do just with, with, uh, with, with a lack of diversification uh, or, or interpretations thereof, but we can talk more about this in the discussion. So to summarize this, at the stock level, we find that stocks with high holdings variability, widely held stocks, tend to have low volatilities. But perhaps more importantly, co-held stocks tend to move together. At the characteristic level, characteristic portfolios that load on stocks, which are, which are essentially widely held, have low volatility. Characteristics with strong co-holdings have high volatility. And perhaps most intriguingly, characteristics with common co-holdings tend to co-move. Now, these patterns are inconsistent with optimal diversification. We do some work using a lasso estimator to basically show you that the CAPM or Fama French style portfolio construction doesn't really uh, explain what's going on here. Uh, but we do believe uh, that it could be the case that if investor clientels buy and sell co-held stocks, co stocks at the same time, that could explain the positive relationship. Okay, so I'm out of time. So let me, let me quickly conclude. So this paper seeks to understand how investors create stock portfolios in a natural environment without assistance from mutual fund managers. We introduce a new cross-sectional factor model of asset holdings, uh, which borrows ideas from time series factor analysis of returns with appropriate adaptations. We find that some stock characteristics have strong clientele as effects associated with them. Uh, and many of these characteristics are sort of less likely to be things that you know, the standard asset pricing literature has focused on. And we find that different types of investors show preferences for large growth stocks, risky lottery-like stocks, and mega IPOs, and so on. And then finally, stocks that are more commonly co-held tend to correlate more strongly with one another, which runs counter to optimal diversification and suggests to us that clientele effects may indeed contribute to common variation in stock returns. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion's comments. Um, thanks so much, Tarun. So Jonathan, uh, you have 10 minutes. I'll uh, give you the mic. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to um, uh, share my slides, uh, so please just put them in, uh, put me in speaker view if, if you can do that, or pin me, um, and that will, uh, will mean that you can then see my slides behind me. Um, first of all, thank you very much for in, in asking me to discuss this paper. Um, it's really um, a tour de force. It has a huge amount in it, a lot to digest. I guess the way I think of it is it's taken 20 to 30 years of asset pricing uh, analysis of sort of returns and factors and, and twisted that and mapped it to replace T with H. Um, so we're thinking about cross households instead of across time periods. Um, and then it has all the results that 20 to 30 years of asset pricing could have about um, about factors in asset pricing um, put into one paper about factors in, in household and account level data. So there's, it's, it's ridiculous for a discussion. Um, I, read it, I read it, I let it digest in my brain. I came back to it, I read it, I thought it was something different. Um, and so I'm just gonna have to pick up and do three sorts of things with it here. Uh, and then I'm probably gonna go back and read it again a couple more times so I can use it and teach it. But for now, um, I'm gonna talk about three things. First of all, uh, let me give you um, a quick overview of the data and the basic behavior in the data. Um, I'm going to focus a little more strongly on, sorry, um, 
I'm losing a bit of my slides. I'm going to focus a little bit more strongly on just the raw data at first, um, rather than the results that, that Tarun did, gave you. Then I'll walk through very quickly the main method and give some of the intuition for what's going on. And then I'll ask a couple of bigger questions uh, about the general theme of this, of this, um, this conference or this, this session today. So first of all, the data is, is great. Um, it has nearly all stock ownership in India uh, as recorded in two registries of stock ownership. ownership. Um, that's 9.7 million accounts, um, which is a very big number, but actually a very small number relative to the population of India and about 3,000 stocks um, and almost new mutual funds, which is very useful. So while we are still missing certainly other assets that the households own, um, they're not naturally diversifying or doing the sorts of things that we think households should do via mutual funds. They have to buy and hold stocks themselves. And so any diversification has to be implemented by them, diversification across industry size, so on and so forth. I think that's useful to think about in the, for the substantive stuff um, that, that Tyrone just went over. Um, there's a good set of measured attributes for stocks. Um, if there's a weakness to the data, it's that there's not a whole lot of measurable characteristics of households. So this is just, we know the accounts. And so while the authors have done an admirable job of teasing out whether some of these features that characterize account level demand for assets map back into the characteristics of households that canonical models think should drive demand for assets. Things like risk, return, hedging motives, um, risk aversion, um, uh, those uh, are more sketchy and hard to get at right now. And then in that sense, I'm thinking this paper is a little bit more of a, um, a mathematical roadmap and, and proof of concept and also sort of the first big step down this path rather than um, the final word. And so that's kind of um, exciting. Um, the account attributes we have really are just age. That's age in months. So most accounts aren't open all that long. Um, and, um, and the typical account, the average account has 8.45 stocks, right? So this kind of, I think of this as the US many, many decades ago, um, not, um, not like the US now. So in that sense, also the lessons at this point um, uh, are not about what the US looks like. How are these accounts invested? Um, diversification. So the, the, the thing Tarun mentioned, most investors hold only a few stocks. The median stock, um, has 5,000 investors. And remember, there's nearly 10 million accounts. So 5,000 accounts, nearly 10 million accounts. And most investors own only a few, and they tend to hold only a few large stocks, those that don't own only a few. And that jumps out in the later, more detailed analysis. The second point, efficiency. Um, the paper provides a characterization of how efficient are these um, uh, holdings by the cap M, where the how conditioning on the number of stocks a given account owns, how close are to they to the cap M implied um, sharp ratio that you could achieve given the market. And so most investors are doing okay. Um, there, that's the blue line and the, the variation around that dotted line is not very big. It's a little bit worse if you look at a four factor model um, of what, what could be the, the efficient frontier. Um, but there's kind of a big question on the paper uh, and for this method and indeed relative to Ralph's introductory comments, which is what is the right benchmark measure of efficiency here? So the paper sort of takes the idea that the benchmark, which I think is right, is that everybody have an equal portfolio share. That's the portfolio matrix that they make and they're measuring deviations from the mean, which kind of has the idea that it's general equilibrium within the household sector. The official out efficient outcome is that everybody should hold what the household sector holds, just in equal proportion and then some share of the risk-free assets, suppose. So there's a two fund separation theorem here. This picture is a slightly different view of that efficiency. It, it takes prices as fixed and asks where the household sector should as on net be trading in or out of, it, of its sector and buying more of certain stocks and less of other stocks. I mentioned that because I think it is a theme for demand-based asset pricing in general here. And especially as we walk down to the portfolio side um, of things that it's really about the heterogeneity that we're analyzing here and not the mean. Um, okay, great. Um, the main results. results. Um, let, let me, yeah, I'll, I'll stay, go through these. Substance. This paper is about the heterogeneity in the portfolio share. So not what observables drive accounts. So, so what observables drive accounts to either hold a lot or a little of a given stock? And that's really the right place to start here. And that wasn't what I sort of approached this paper thinking would be the right place to start. So um, I, I learned a fair bit here. 
The findings are that investors tend to segregate on stock age a lot. Some accounts hold young, some accounts hold, hold old stocks. Also, stock price, past returns, and turnover. Not what I think of as the observable risk-based characteristics of the stocks, things like size, value, the things that we actually think move around the returns. And so it seems to the extent that relevant characteristics, <laughs> irrelevant characteristics matter and relevant ones don't, that's, that's sort of what comes out here. Account attributes that drive heterogeneity include account age and number of stocks traded, and also a few of the others. What doesn't matter is geography, which while crudely measured in the paper is the one where you might think hedging motives are different by geography and therefore portfolios should maybe differ by geography. Again, to the extent that it's not great measure, fine, but the, the what things that do matter don't correlate obviously with the things that canonical theories think should matter. And then, um, some in, there's tend to be clusters of stock holdings. So older accounts like older stocks, large accounts like high return stocks. Um, uh, again, one thing I wanted to point out was that th th this is just a thought about this being account level data for now, is that there's something of a flavor in some of this heterogeneity as there being different purposes for different accounts. And so one does wonder if I had a Vanguard account and a Robin Hood account, those would look very different. And those ha might have some of the clustering properties that you observe but at the household level, it wouldn't be, look so bad. And indeed, there's other work in household finance in, in other countries that says that briefers papers are pretty well diversified, but then hold the stock or two that aren't so well um, diversified. Um, some of the authors uh, of the same papers. Uh, Jonathan, you have two more minutes. Okay, um, then I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna use two minutes for two different things. Mm -hmm. um, if I thought, so, so one of the ways to think through this method is just think about running a regression of a portfolio shares on, on characteristics in a variety of different ways. The paper, uh, and, and then taking the variance of the predicted share of that variation. If the characteristics are all, all orthogonal, then the regression equation, the variance of the predicted or fitted portfolio shares can be broken up into the prediction parts that are due to each characteristic. That's essentially what's going on in, in the paper. Okay, I, I don't really have time to walk through that, but that's essentially what they're doing. And so what we're trying to see is not about this, which you might think is a good way to start, but in fact is a terrible way to start because you're gonna find, for example, that the characteristics that American investors love are big stocks. Why? Because the portfolio share of big stocks is big and it's a supply, not a demand. This is about heterogeneity and so it's a really nice separation. Okay, a couple of thoughts about, so that's the actual method, a couple of thoughts about demand-based asset pricing. Um, so canonical asset pricing is demand-based asset pricing. And so what we're doing when we're doing this demand-based one is we're throwing in other characteristics besides risk and return. And besides measures of preferences on the household characteristic side and seeing whether they work. Oh, so when we're doing that, we're either asking one of two questions. We're either trying to find observables that maybe better measure the things that the theories say should work. And why might that happen? Well, one reason that might happen is because in all of our canonical models right now, we assume the phenomenal amount of knowledge about all sorts of parameters of returns and expectations as if households know them with certainty. If they don't, then predictable observable characteristics may, they may find useful in real time to predict returns. And those might therefore be characteristics that lead us to a better understanding of how much risk and return is understood in real time and, and which models are right of the canonical variety. The other version of that is we're looking to understand the ways in which people deviate from the canonical theory, either by using heuristics, which they're using these observable characteristics to implement, or actually having biases, heterogeneous beliefs or differences of other types that lead to a quite different view than the, the sort of what I would call the revolution of modern finance, which is that we don't value assets for their color, name, paper size, et cetera. We value them for the consumption they deliver and the risk exposure to that consumption. And so this is really the world that says, okay, how close are we to that? And are these deviations important? And those are, I think, the central questions of this demand-based asset pricing, as opposed to thinking about when we have to make these demand systems, they're giving us some sort of deep structural parameters that we can use as policy invariants to do aggregate experiments or understand um, QE. Uh, thanks so much, Jonathan. And Tarone, because there are a bunch of questions, I'll first ask some questions and then uh, hopefully maybe you will have time to also address some of Jonathan's uh, comments.
So the um, uh, first question is, it was posted in the chat. So Petra Singal from University of Iowa, please ask your question. Oh, Hello. sorry, one more thing. Uh, please don't forget to raise your hands or ask your questions in chat if you have more questions. Sorry, Petra, go ahead. No problem, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So my question relates to the relationship between the cross-sectional variation in the household heterogeneity and the performance of their account. So whether you also tested which types of accounts from which uh, households actually had, let's say, higher than a uh, usual performance, maybe some kind of uh, benchmark adjusted return, directional and, and lower. And, uh, and uh, whether you can use some of these account characteristics to predict account performance. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, so, so thank you for that question. Th that's not the focus of this particular paper, but it is something that uh, John Benranish and I did in another paper, uh, which is now in the a in AER Insights in 2019. And there, the particular characteristic of accounts that we were looking at that determined performance differentials was the size of these accounts. Uh, so what we find in that particular paper is that um, larger accounts um, don't seem to have higher just simple mean returns than, than smaller accounts, but they do have higher geometric average returns. And the reason is essentially because larger accounts are diversifying more efficiently than small accounts. So th that's the paper that sort of might help um, uh, to sort of answer some of those questions about performance. But in this case, what we're really trying to do is to, is to really sort of get at this question of, of clientele effects. I mean, how do they organize their portfolios along what, what dimensions can we group them? Uh, is really the concern of this paper. I, ho I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, uh, so uh, the next question is from Dimitri Muraviev from Michigan State. Dimitri, sorry if I mispronounced your last name. So you should be on mute. Oh, uh, perfect. Uh, so my question is about the supply of information. So do you know what information brokers typically display in India? So if it's something weight, for example, C was age, we would expect investors to use whatever information is available. Thank you. Great paper, by the way. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, what, what we're doing here is sort of providing a general methodology to extract what seems important in the data. And it's pretty clear that things like age, share price, and so on, come out being uh, dimensions that are important to organize sort of the cross-section of or to explain the cross-section of holdings. What we are, we haven't done yet is to sort of go back to the microeconomics of why those particular things work the way they do. And it may well be uh, that one hypothesis is that the information that's demonstrated and that's sort of exhibited through broker networks or something along those lines uh, has something to do with the organization uh, of these portfolios along these dimensions. I mean, this is the sort of thing I think, this is the sort of question that we're really happy for people to ask. Um, you know, once they, so, so we wanted to establish these facts and then we'd like people to kind of, you know, go out there and, uh, uh, and sort of spend some time really filling in the blanks in a way, uh, which we haven't done uh, in this particular exercise. But thank you for that question. Uh, okay, great. So Tarun, I guess now this is a good time that you uh, answer like Jonathan's comments. Yeah. Sure. Um, so first of all, I think, you know, I think this is great. Jonathan, thank you for your reactions. I, I could see that you have, you know, a lot more slides than you you had a, a, had a chance to present. So I'm looking forward to digging into those. I mean, you know, you've really re returned the favor. I know that this was a, a tough paper to read and a dense paper, but uh, we will we will now have to dig into your dense slides and sort of really spend some time thinking about those carefully. Um, but but I do agree with the last thing that you said, which is that I, I think having, you know, at least at the, as a first pass, certainly for household finance, uh, understanding how retail uh, how households construct portfolios, even just having a descriptive understanding of those kinds of things and sort of understanding what factors motivate them or what, what incentives drive them to, to, to hold portfolios in this way seems to us to be a first step before one can go into more serious policy analysis of any type. And, and you know, I fully agree with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the other comments are concerned, you know, nothing to disagree with. We, we have lots of work to do and we'll, we'll follow, uh, follow on. So thank you. Uh, okay, great. So we are right on time. So um, if uh, I think it's the best time to move on to the next paper. So uh, Valentin, uh, well, you have the a whole podium. 
thank you, Mariam. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for having our paper. Uh, it's great to see you all, even though it's virtual. Uh, this paper is titled, How Competitive is the Stock Market? It is joint work with Paul Hubner, who's a fantastic grad student at UCLA, and Eric Loalis from Minnesota. And they're both here today, actually, so uh, they would be really happy to take your question in the chat, and we very much look forward to your feedback. <coughs> so let me tell you what got us started on this paper. There are many important questions in finance that are about figuring out the effect of a change in the trading strategy of some institutions on equilibrium asset prices. One such big question, which we will talk about today, are the consequences of the rise of passive investing. Say a fraction of the population of institutions becomes passive, what happens to equilibrium prices? And the most standard answer to this type of question in the finance literature is, is simply that nothing happens. The justification for these answers is that financial markets are very competitive. So these local changes will somehow fix themselves in equilibrium. If you dig a little bit more, the idea is that the direct effect of the change in strategy, the yellow arrow here, is counteracted by the fact that other investors change their strategies as well in response to that. In the case of passive investing, this would be the remainder of investors trading more actively. Another more fun example is the case of arbitrage. If somebody stops looking for $20 bills on the floor, it's not a big deal because somebody else will do it instead. What the views that markets are very competitive tells you is that these equilibrium responses are very strong, actually so strong that they exactly compensate the direct effect. In this paper, we want to ask how large the competitive response actually is relative to the direct effect. And once you have a number for this relative intensity, we can plug it in and plug in the rise of passive investing and ask what are its implications for prices. And as a remark, you know, for today, we will focus on passive investing, but I want to point out upfront that these equilibrium responses matter for other interesting questions. Another such question that's been the focus of a lot of my research is what happens when intermediaries get distressed or start facing different regulation and trade more conservatively. You could also think about what happens when an arbitrage, think a hedge fund like Melvin Capital, goes bust. The first thing we do is to formalize the notion of investor competition of equilibrium response. One insight is that while there are many reasons why investors change their trading strategies, these changes can be summarized by a choice of demand elasticity in many theories. Said otherwise, at the end of the day, what matters is how aggressively you trade against price movements. From there, we propose a simple sufficient statistic for the strengths of equilibrium responses, which we call competition K. It is the answer to how much does my demand elasticity respond to a change in the aggregate demand elasticity. In my arbitrage analogy, it is asking if I hear that some, there's one less person looking for $20 bills on the floor, how much harder do I look? Uh, one big disclaimer I want to make is that this notion of competition is mostly unrelated to the more mainstream economics notion of being a price taker or not. Rather, we follow the classic finance saying in rela relating it to the strength of equilibrium response or what people sometimes call strategic substituability in trade. Building on this notion, we put forward a framework to quantify competition and its implication for prices. By this, I mean a model you can estimate from data on how people trade. This takes the form of a demand system, which accounts for investor heterogeneity, but also for equilibrium relations. The novel aspect of our model is that it takes the form of what we call a two-layer equilibrium. Naturally, prices adjust so that the market for each asset clears, but a new part is the second layer of how investors choose their strategies in response to others. In particular, how investors choose their demand elasticities in response to the aggregate. We show a tractable way to deal with this structure, in particular, how to use it empirically to identify the level of competition. Finally, and maybe most importantly, we, we take this model to the data. We use data on portfolios in the US stock market from 13F filings, and we find that competition is far from perfect, with K equal to 1.7. What that means is if you're a small trader and the aggregate elasticity in the market decreases by one, you increase yours by 1.7. This is far from the idea of perfectly competitive market, which would be a okay, guy closer to infinity. But this is still, and in particular, at the individual level, a non-negligible strength of response. In equilibrium, what that leaves us is that competition dampens the effect of individual changes in behavior only by about half, by 50%. And if you apply this multiplier to the rise of passive investing that we can measure in the data, this predicts that the demand for individual stocks has become significantly more inelastic over the last 20 years, by about 
Uh, for the rest of the talk, I, I want to first show you, zoom in on, on the core of our framework, this notion of a two-layer equilibrium and this notion of competition. And then I'll tell you how we can take this idea to the data and what we learn about the evolution of the stock market from this exercise. So the first layer of our framework is extremely standard. It is the idea that each investor demands some amount of an asset. Here, I is an investor. DI is the amount she demands. Small letters are logs, big letters are level. And to make it simple, we assume that each investor's demand is just decreasing in the price with elasticity EI. The demand elasticity is the answer to by how many percent do you increase the quantity of asset demanded in response to a percent decrease in price. It measures how aggressively you trade against price movements. To go from individual decisions to a price, you need an equilibrium condition. The sum of demands is equal to the supply. Our model introduces competition through a second layer, it determines the demand elasticity. Here we assume that each investor's elasticity combines an individual effect, that's E bar I, and a response to other investors materialized by the aggregate demand elasticity. Intuitively, my own characteristics, how sophisticated I am, how risk averse, et cetera, determine my demand elasticity, but also who else I am trading with. Here again, because investors interact with an equilibrium condition, it is that the aggregate elasticity combines individual decisions. The key parameter in this model is competition chi. When chi is equal to zero, each investor lives their own life. If others become passive, well, you know, good for them. You stay the course and trade in the same way. The other extreme is when chi goes to infinity. That's the full competition view. Here, anytime there's a change in behavior, other investors step in and counteract it in full force. A few investors become passive, while everybody else becomes more active to contact. Of course, and I will show you that that's actually what we find in the data. We live somewhere in the middle with some partial competition. And a number of theories can justify this case. For example, when a rational trader tries to profit from abnormal price movements, for example, caused by irrational traders, she does so less aggressively when she's surrounded by more other traders, and these other traders are more aggressive. Similarly, if others look harder for dollar bills on the floor, you're going to do it less. It also happens in theories of information acquisition. If others are more informed about prices, they are more aggressive, but then information becomes less valuable to you and you become less aggressive. You could also have negative values of CAC, and then investor reactions would amplify each other. This happens in theories of liquidity, in the sale of CAL 89, or, or if you just get excited by talking to others on Reddit. Now we're completely aware that writing these equations like that is a little bit non-standard in finance, but it turns out that the mapping of the models I'm talking about to our framework is actually very, very tight. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to show you this connection in detail today, but it is in the paper and the appendix is are growing actually fast with more and more applications, but we show how many classic models can be restated in, in this as this two-layer equilibrium. Our main use for this framework is to ask what happens in response to a rise in passive investing. To think about this, we start from a homogeneous group of investors, all with the same elasticity E0, and then the aggregate elasticity is the average, also E0. In the data, the last 20 years, I've seen a large increase in the quantity of passive investing, and that corresponds to reducing the fraction of active investors by about 30%. If there is no competition, it just means that going from the initial situation to a situation where 30% of investors simply do not respond to prices, and the remaining 70%, that's why I call alpha, um, <coughs> is unchanged. Then the average elasticity simply becomes alpha times E0. We obtain a proportional reduction in elasticity. The market becomes much more inelastic. But with competition, things change because the remaining active investors will change their strategy as well. Because the market overall has become less elastic, they become more aggressive. This makes the aggregate increase back up. But this increase prompts us again a second order response where the active investors decrease back down. That lowers the aggregate again, and you can keep going back and forth until this stabilizes to a new equilibrium. Adding up all those reactions, we obtain the new aggregate elasticity, which combines the direct effect in green and the total competitive response in red. The most extreme case is when competition is extremely strong and chi goes to infinity. Here you can see that this ratio goes to one. And, and, and the competitive compensation brings the elasticity back to its initial level. That's very different from no competition. In that view, the rise of passive investing has no effect on the demand for stocks. The goal of the paper is not only to point out 
that it's important to understand that competition can be there by actually to quantify it. So I'm going to show you in a few slides how we are able to estimate the parameter chi by using the cross-section of stocks and investors. And just to be clear, we're going to think about chi as a constant parameter capturing the competitive structure of the market and will feed through it the time series of the rise in passive investment. We estimate that chi is equal to 1.7. If I just plug into this formula, this implies that the aggregate deep elasticity has decreased by about 14%. That's a large number, in particular compared to the idea that nothing should happen. But that's also about only half of what you'd find if you just ignore the equilibrium forces. When I show you the framework we use for estimation, I'll redo this calculation, of course, in a slightly in a richer way that accounts for investor heterogeneity. But it turns out the numbers are very similar. So let's move towards the data. So we want to take this, this framework with those two layers and quantify it. What's different, of course, in the data is that there are many stocks and many investors, and they're all very different from each other. So how do we do that? So we're going to get data on stocks you know, from Crisp and CompuStat. But what we're really interested in is how do people actually trade? So we're going to use the 13F filings to the SEC, where every, every institution that has assets under management of $100 million has to report their position to the SEC every, each quarter. That gets us to about 80% of the total ownership of the stock market in the 2000s. And the residual will just call as one last investor that we're going to call a household. Unfortunately, we don't have as nice, as, as nice data as uh, Tarun uh, showed us just before. And then we're going to enrich our model to take into account the fact that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the data and that investors choose among multiple sources. And, and so we're going to build on an idea from a paper by Kojen and Yogo that says that you can represent portfolio choice with a logic specification of portfolio shares. So instead of simply writing the demand, you want to keep track of demand, so portfolio share relative to price, relative to a baseline demand. But after that, this is exactly our two-layer equilibrium. The demand for each stock is driven by some um, investor-specific function of characteristics. So each investor has specific taste for characteristics that we can measure. There's a residual that's unobservable to us as the econometrician that captures you know, how the investor might have some private signals about the asset or might just do some noise trading or, or different beliefs. And finally, there's a response to the price. That's, the, that's what the elasticity shows up. Now, this elasticity, importantly, in our model, is endogenous. It's not just a fixed number. It depends on the mapping between this investor and the characteristics. So we have investor-specific loading on characteristics. And it depends on the response to other investors. In particular, this response is a response to the aggregate elasticity for these specific stocks. So what that means is that each individual investor is going to be more or less aggressive against, in trading against prices as a function of what's the average elasticity of trader for this stock. Um, this model actually embeds uh, the model from Kojen and Yogo. Uh, in their framework, there's just no competition. So it's equivalent to assuming that this chi is equal to zero. Uh, finally, for, for the data, it's going to be very important to separate out passive investors. And we're just going to do a first round of using the cogen yogo elasticity and, and split out anybody who seems to not respond to prices. So mechanically, that's going to pick up every formal index investor. That's a slightly larger notion that, in, that, that incorporates anybody who just doesn't respond to prices. Then, of course, we have our two layer of equilibrium. So the prices have to clear asset demands, and the aggregate elasticity has to aggregate individual decisions. Now, this is a nice structure, it's very rich. The, the question, of course, is how, how can you identify it? In particular, particular how can you uh, measure competition? And there are three challenges for that. The first one is, is a reflection problem that happens in any situation with, with social interaction. The second one is that it's hard to estimate demand. There's always some endogeneity floating around. And the last one is, is to take this to the computer. So in the interest of time, I'm going to speak mostly about the first one, and, and I'll just sketch out what we do for the others. So the reflection problem is very important. So is this the following idea? Let's say I see that Ralph is trading GameStop very aggressively. I'm sure that's what he's been doing uh, actually the last few days. And so here you have a natural question that is, is it that he's on his own a very aggressive trader? Or is it that he just you know, hang, hangs out with Jonathan on Econ Twitter and he got convinced that GameStop is super exciting? That's what we're trying to separate out at the end of the day. And the, the simple insight that we use to, to go over this problem is that there are many stocks. And Ralph is trading in many stocks. So not only is he excited about GameStop, but he's also trading Tesla. 
And when it's trailing Tesla, it's going to face different investors and might have a different aggressivity. And so just by comparing how Ralph trades when it's facing different investors, we can figure out what is what are his own characteristics and what are his response to other investors. Of course, there's a little bit of chicken and egg problem. That is, well, I'm using this to learn something about Ralph, but I already have to know something about the other investors. And so everybody's connected and you have to solve everything at the same time. It turns out we, we, we show actually in the paper that you can use the network structure of investor. And as long as the network structure of investor stock is connected, this graph is connected and is not degenerate in specific way, you obtain identification. So you can actually solve this chicken and egg problem. And what's nice for us is that the data, as actually Tarun showed us a little bit before, but actually even more so for institution, is very much like that. We have a lot of variation in who is trading which stock. And for example, the median number of stocks that's held by the investor in our data is only about 81. So you're going to get very different population for very different stocks. You're going to be able to separate out th this competition effect. Stepping back a little bit, there's still this issue of this unobserved residual. That is, there's part, you know, there, there, there's some endogenous variation in the regression. In particular, the price, but here as well, the aggregate elasticity are both equilibrium outcomes. So of course, they're endogenous to demand. If everybody demands more of the stock, the price will be high, for example. So the residual of the demand is exactly correlated, with, is going to tend to be correlated with the price. Uh, for, we need two instruments, one for the price, one for the aggregate elasticity. For the price, we actually follow uh, Ralph and Moto's paper by, by just keeping track of how much money would go to our stock K if all investors invest in an equal weighted portfolio. For the aggregate elasticity, it's a little bit more subtle because we don't even observe it directly before we estimate the model. So we need to create what, what is called what we call a model-based instrument, which is a, a counterfactual elasticity if everybody um, uses equal weight portfolios. This is an instrument that's based on model parameter. That means that we have to estimate the instrument and the model at the same time. Uh, this might seem a little bit non-standard, but it turns out that's completely economy, ec econometrically okay to do that. Uh, finally, we need to take this in the computer. So there are many fixed effects. Uh, we, we, we allow a lot of flexibility for investors, and you have to solve this equilibrium for, for LSTs at the same time. Uh, the short version is that if you don't do this carefully, your computer is going to blow up. Uh, so it's going to run for days and probably stop running after a while. Um, but what we found out is there's something about the structure of this problem that you can somewhat invert. So you can separate out sim a relatively simple in equilibrium problem that's only one dimension, and then quick regressions are quick to run. And so we have a code and, and, and we detail the algorithm in the paper to, to actually estimate this rich equilibrium model in about five minutes uh, for a given quad. Let me now, now go to the actual results. So the, the first result I want to show you are our, our estimates of competition chi. So again, chi is how strongly do you respond to the, the elasticity of other investors in setting your elasticity. We have a separate estimate for each quarter because our identification comes entirely from the cross section. So here I'm plotting a histogram of those estimates. And you can see that they're all relatively concentrated between one and two and a half. The average actually is 1.7 in our sample. And so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna use as our headline number. There's no trend in competition over time in, in the data. So, so it's not that there's less competition or more competition. Actually, it seems very stable ar around this value of 1.7. What that implies is that the same investor responds less to price movements for assets when they are more aggressive investors than for assets where they are less aggressive investors. And this is a substantial response. So if all other investors are more aggressive by one, you lower your elasticity by 1.7. Yet this is very far from perfect competition. So this guy is much less than infinity. Of course, infinity is always far away from any number, but to be very concrete, in the civil calculation I did at the beginning, if you ask what would it take to have a 90% compensation of the direct effect of a rising passive, you need values of chi around 18, so an order of magnitude larger than what we find in the data. So we are very, very far from this idea that you know, investors react and compensate every direct change. The model doesn't only give us this number. Actually, it gives us estimates of the elasticity for each and every stock. Uh, here, the green dots are, are the one from our model. The red dots, because I, I want to compare a little bit, are from a model where we assume no competition at all. And I keep plotting them as a function of market capitalization. And there's a few remarks I want to make about those estimates. The first one, and, and Ralph actually talked about this quite at length 
uh, in his introduction is that these elasticities are low. So they're about 0.3. Again, if you want to do in price impact, that's, that's about three. Uh, that's very much consistent with, with previous studies, so other structural model or kind of quasi-experimental evidence. That's much lower than this idea that you know, demand curve for, for stocks are flat. The demand curve for stocks seem to be pretty downward sloping. It does a strong size effect, and it's telling us even stronger with endogenous elasticity than, than exogenous elasticity. And it's, it's saying that it's important to account for the fact that even the same investor trades differently for different stocks. The demand elasticity is not a, a fixed characteristic of the investor. It depends on which stock you trade. In particular, investors seem to be less willing to change their positions in large stock that occupy a large share of their portfolio than, than smaller stock that are a small fraction of their portfolio. Finally, and you can probably see this a little bit on this picture, and again, we quantify it in the paper, there's less cross-sectional cross variation in elasticity. So all stocks tend to be more similar once you have this endogenous elasticity. And the intuition is the following. Typically, let's say you see a very active investor show up and start trading a given stock. In the aggregate trading for this stock would tend to become more aggressive, and, and this stock would, you know, there would be stronger response of trading to prices for this stock. But what, I, what we see happens in the data is actually that all our other investors step back and trade less aggressively. And so that's going to compensate these changes in composition. And so it's not that every elasticity is the same. Again, we say that this comp competition is far from perfect, but it's going to tend to shrink the cross sectional variation in elasticity. Now, let, let me go to, 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 uh, to, to the biggest prediction we're after, which is what happens when we face a big rise in passive investing. So again, there are many, many ways you could measure passive investing. Uh, we, we like to do a model-based one, but you can also just look at raw data. So in particular, you can look at what mutual funds do. Here I'm plotting over the last 30 years, roughly what, what is the fraction of stocks held, held by active mutual funds, that the, the dash blue line, and the fraction of stock held by passive or mutual funds or ETF. That's the solid black line. Uh, that's from the ICI fact book. So what you can see is that active funds have been stagnant or actually even slightly declining over, over the last few years, whereas passive funds that were pretty much inexistent at the beginning of the 90s have been growing and growing, growing steadily for the last 30 years, and that they occupy about 15% of the stock market. If we take this slightly more comprehensive view, definition of passive that's more model-based, we get a slightly larger number, but of the same order of magnitude. So we find that the fraction of active investors has gone down from about 78% to 58% in the stock market from 2000 to 2016. These are very large numbers. So you know, uh, this expansion is actually as large as the growth of institutional ownership over the same time period. So the question is, you know, let's say we fit this trend and given the competitive structure of the market, what happens to elasticities in the market? Is the market becoming less elastic or more elastic? And so, to do this, we're going to repeat the calculation I started this talk with, except that now we're going to, to entertain all the, the, all the heterogeneity across investors and across stocks. So for each stock, the aggregate elasticity, you can show that it's, it's the product of how many active investors we have, how active are those active investors, so what's the average elasticity, elasticity baseline elasticity, and a general premium effect that comes from those competitive compensation. So here you can see our parameter chi showing you. And with this, you can simply ask, well, what happens if I exogenously change the active share? Of course, we know that the rise of passive investing is not purely exogenous, but that's a simple way to get started. Actually, you can microfund it in, in multiple ways, and this calculation will still be correct. So you can simply compute what's the elasticity, so what's the pass-through of a change in the fraction of active investor to a great elasticity, and you obtain this simple sufficient statistic. So it's one over one plus this competition parameter, 1.7, and the baseline level of active investor, because they're the only ones who respond to others, 65%. And what it gives us is it gives us a, a response, a pass-through of about 50%, 47.5% more precisely. What that implies is that when we saw this 30% decrease in active investing, LSTs have dropped by half of that, so about 14.25%. That's, that's a large decrease. Now, we don't have to stop here. Minutes. Okay, great. Thank you, Maya. Uh, we don't have to stop here. And we can, rather than just doing this counterfactual exercise, we can also just describe what actually happened in the data. Because we have a new estimation each quarter. Again, we haven't used at all the time series. 
in our identification strategy, but we can just see how investors' uh, trading behavior change over time. And so this is what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm not, not trying to do this more causal counterfactual exercise, but asking what actually happened to elasticities. And what we see is for the solid black line is the average elasticity, aggregate elasticity across stocks. It has is the change, sorry, in the aggregate elasticity. It has declined actually quite strongly, even more than my 15% by about 30% over the sample. And the reason for that is that, yes, the fraction of active investor has decreased. That's the red line that's decreasing. But also, the remaining active investor, even on their own, their own in elasticity has decreased as well. Other active, even active investors are trading less actively than they used to. Of course, it's not a homogeneous decline because you get this competitive response. So because in part, you know, even though on their own, the active investors are becoming less aggressive, you see that when they see others become passive, they, they respond by compensating and becoming more aggressive. That's this blue line, this very strong equilibrium response. So in net, you, you know, if you if you are to just sum those two decline, you would get much more than that, but the, com the, com the competition lowers the total effect. To put numbers on that, the aggregated elasticity has decreased by about 35% over, over the length of our sample. It's roughly coming 50-50 from a decrease in how many active investors we have. So this rise of passive investing that has received lots of attention, but also from other investors becoming less aggressive based on their own characteristics. But again, half of that has been compensated by, by this competitive response. Um, <coughs> so again, you know, you can see the glass half full or the glass half, half empty. Uh, yes, there are strong competitive response. So that we see much less decline than we would see by assuming that all investors are just living their own life. But no, we, we are very far uh, from a perfect competition and a perfect cancellation of changes in investor composition. So investor composition does matter quite a bit. For, for a great demand for stocks. Uh, let me just show you one last vi visualization uh, of this result. This black line is the trend that actually happened. That's the last graph that I showed you. But we could ask, well, let's fit all those changes in individual investor characteristics. So let's fit the fact that we have more passive investors. Let's fit the fact that even the active investors want to trade less actively now. But now let's change this parameter chi as we, we compute the new equilibrium of elasticity. If you set chi to infinity, this perfect competition, you see virtually no change in elasticity in the market. Actually, the only reason you see a little bit is because the universe of stocks being traded is changing a little bit over time. So you, you just have a, a little bit of composition effect in stocks, but nothing would happen. In the opposite extreme, if you assume that there was no competition at all, you would see a much larger decline. You would see actually twice as large of a decline, and you would see that the stock market will become extremely inelastic. So competition did kind of like slow down this effect. Of, of much more inelastic market. Uh, let me conclude. Um, <coughs> sorry. First, I, I hope that I convince you that this notion of investor competition is, is a useful way and a, and a useful formalization to, to, to start thinking about what are the equilibrium effects of changing investor behavior, such as the rise of passive investing, or also many other applications. And it's useful not, not only because it's simple, but also because we can embed it in actual equilibrium model and, and quantify it. And once we do that, I think we learn interesting things about the stock market. So we learn that the stock market is actually very far from this ideal that we often talk about of perfect competition that investors compete and fix any problems in the market. And for example, what I, what I showed you is that it dampens the direct effect by about half, only 50%. What it means is that the rise of passive investing likely had a very large effect on the stock market, leading to about 15% more in elastic markets. There are many other places uh, where this would be important. You know, Ralph talked about a few of them. Tarun talks about a few of them. Jonathan already talked about a few of them. Again, some that I, 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 I like are thinking, thinking about uh, the more intermediation sector and how when we regulate value financial institutions, that's going to have an effect on how other investors trade. Uh, another very interesting question is, as data become more available, you know, if Citadel has much better computer and servers to trade, should that discourage us from trading quite a, a, as aggressively? And finally, in international finance, what if you know, some large player like China stop buying treasuries? How, how is the rest of the market going to react? And so for this, we have to understand not only the demand of each investor, but how investors interact together in selling those things. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Valentino. And Harrison, uh, please go ahead and share your slides. You have 10 minutes. Great. 
All right, thanks, Mariam. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, can you see my slides? Uh, yes. Do you want me to go full screen? Yes, that would be amazing. Does that work? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Great. Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, this this pretty this very insightful paper. Uh, there's a lot in this paper, uh, as 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 Val's uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, demonstrated. I'm, I'm going to give a more focused take on 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 what I think is kind of more the the, uh, the 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 most central aspect of the paper. Um. So so what does this paper do? Um. It seeks to estimate sort of a, a fun institutional investors. Uh, stock demand elasticity using these, these 13F filings. Uh, basically, you could do, a, of course, if you do that, you can do a bunch of things with it. One of the things I'll just focus on is to then get uh, uh, aggregate up to the uh, aggregate demand elasticity at the stock level, okay? And uh, I think kind of the main, the main contribution of the paper is that it generalizes the specification uh, in, in, in the Kojin Yogo paper. Uh, so in the Kojin Yogo paper, they, they kind of derived uh, as an approximation of a log utility demand with disagreement and short sales constraints, uh, the specification that I'm putting my arrow over, right? So you're going to have as a dependent variable log of uh, the weight of manager I on stock K, uh, normalized by its outside assets, uh, and then I'm going to abbreviate and focus on kind of the main term. Uh, it's going to basically depend on PK, which is the price uh, or the market cap of of, of asset K. Uh, the, the EIK is the latent demand term. Um, and then kind of the key term is this is really this, this elasticity term, which is, I'll rewrite it as one minus uh, epsilon zero I minus then the chi times the epsilon ag K, right? So, so let's just start. So again, in, in KY, uh, chi is zero, okay? Uh, and so if you estimate that epsilon zero I is, is zero, uh, that's pretty much a, a perfectly uh, inelastic demand on the part of fun I for, for, for stock K. Okay. Uh, so of course, uh, I think what HHL uh, would argue is that, you know, I think in, if you just think of many of the theories that we have in finance, uh, there should be some, some, some equilibrium feedback. Uh, think about kind of a Grossman Stiglitz uh, model where uh, there's going to be some, some equilibrium amount of, of information acquisition in the economy. Uh, so, so that's going to be captured by this this chi greater than zero uh, parameter. And so of course, uh, a short way of summarizing this is that the estimates in Koizen Yogo are potentially biased uh, if, if, if depending on sort of, um, you know, sort of a, a form of limited variable bias, although a very complicated form because epsilon ag k itself is uh, an endogenous variable that's determined that, that depends on, 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 on the equilibrium. Uh, so the paper, uh, Val talked a lot about the reflection issues uh, associated with that point. Uh, he talked less about the instruments, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, so they start with this, the KY instrument of PK, right? So you need an instrument because the concern, of course, is that EIK uh, um, uh, is, is, you know, these, these two pieces are not orthogonal. And the instrument is going to be a popularity of stock K in, in fund manager mandates. Uh, I'll call that uh, P hat K. Now you actually need two instruments uh, to, to estimate their system. Uh, so they're gonna kind of apply a similar idea uh, uh, to using these mandates to kind of get a second instrument for, for epsilon ag, ag K, right? And, and I think the general result is that they find more inelastic demand curves than, than KY, okay? Uh, so this is, I think, kind of the, the most interesting picture. And I'm gonna spend a little time on the numbers and, and kind of give you a sense of the numbers. So basically the red is, 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 is the KY estimate, right? So this is now uh, um, after all the computation, et cetera, uh, this is gonna be the uh, epsilon. Uh, this is the elasticity uh, uh, at, the, at the aggregate level for stock K, okay? And, and so what you see is that for the most part, uh, when you account for this, um, this, this, this potential feedback, uh, you're gonna get uh, more inelastic uh, uh, demand, okay? Uh, I, I don't know that obviously, like I was trying to think through it, I and mean, it's not clear to me which way the bias would go in the beginning. I mean, obviously it's a pretty sophisticated model, um, but, but you know, I think that the results are, are, are very provocative. Uh, I'll kind of point two things. Um, first is there's a very strong uh, size effect, you know, like, uh, um, you know, basically in, in the HHL estimates, we're talking like 
these big stocks here, Apple, are, are you know essentially inelastic, right? You know, basically the epsilon is basically getting close to zero. Uh, there's going to be some standard errors and whatnot, but uh, uh, but you know, basically what this is saying is that, and here I want to connect. I think this is why this paper is so insightful, is that you know. Uh, if you start taking, so like in KY, of course, the view is that all the investors are essentially consumers and we're treating the demand system much in the way you would think about treating goods, goods prices, right? Uh, and, and of course, I think the model is, uh, the paper is completely correct. You know, we should definitely entertain a more general specification uh, that allows also for the role of information, right? Uh, and of course, if you start taking that view, you know, you can also think about other ways to test, right? You know, in other words, like the epsilon now basically is a one-to-one -one mapping to information efficiency. Okay, so so you know, think about uh, so this is a, another kind of important equation in their paper, right? Uh, that uh, you can have uh, basically the price is equal to some fundamental value plus uh, the inverse of the ag uh, times basically x. X is going to be the 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 the, the, the exogenous kind of non-informational uh, sub supply shocks, right? And so what the, what the estimates imply is that, you know, large stocks are going to be less informationally efficient, right? Because, you know, these, these guys are essentially, uh, epsilon ag is close to zero. This thing basically blows up, right? So any, basically almost all movements, it's basically saying almost all the movements of Apple computers is going to be non-informational. Okay. And, and of course, I, I think that's probably counterintuitive to what you think are most of the tests that we've done on, if you kind of do it at the information efficiency level. And so let's think about a few few different tests. So you know, there's an old literature on market microstructure, right? There's like you know, there's many papers I could kind of talk about, but like for instance, there's a series of these low McKinley papers, where you know, kind of in the heyday uh, uh, of, of of testing kind of the random walk hypothesis, you know, I think the perceived wisdom is typically big stocks are very informationally efficient, right? It's the small stocks that are not informationally efficient, okay. Uh, and then, you know, I think there's a kind of different number of different reasons why you can kind of make that argument. You know, they have more analysts, maybe their arms are a bit better, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's also just, you know, less, less frictions because of some scale effects uh, associated with creating like shorting markets. Uh, uh, and, you know, so the list kind of goes on. And if you think about the more recent behavioral finance literature, you know, I think the typical, the perceived wisdom is also there's much more anomalies in small stocks. Right, uh, you know, think about like the value effect is much larger in small stocks. Right, uh, there's more momentum in uh, in, in, in small stocks. Uh, there's also more post earnings announcement drift in small stocks. Okay, so so I think what this paper is pretty nice in connecting, I think, is connecting, you know, these these estimates at the 13 F filings of of, of of these elasticities aggregate up to the aggregate level is one way to do it, but it also, of course, the paper suggests there's a connection where you can kind of come back at the, at least at the aggregate elasticity, right, using price information. Okay, so what 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 I think is kind of driving this effect? So I mean, I think uh, um, I don't believe. I guess I don't believe that most of you know. I don't think that Apple is the least informationally efficient stock in the stock market. Right. Uh, uh, so I, I think that that's a pretty counterintuitive result. So uh, sorry, numbers away. So what do I think is kind of happening? So I mean, obviously, I think some of this has to do with the with the nature of the instrument. So let me see if I can kind of understand and walk you through the instrument. So the way I think the instrument works is, you know, think about Apple, right? So, so Apple is, is in the S&P 500, it's in the Russell 1000, it's in like just basically a, a bunch of indices essentially. And think about GameStop. GameStop is, you know, it's gonna basically be in Russell value, right? It's not gonna be in so many mandates. Okay, so, so my understanding of the instrument is that you can instrument basically then uh, based on the heterogeneity, right? The variation that you're using is that different stocks are gonna be in some sense, be in more mandates than others. Okay, uh, and, and, and I think the, the exclusion restriction is that as long as you think that the asset allocations, that is the distribution across these mandates, that condition on the allocation, choices of stocks within those mandates are, are orthogonal, right, to, 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 to these allocations of these mandates, okay? And, and you know, I mean, I think kind of, it, it's probably, I guess it's kind of okay, I think in the sense that if you think about the small stocks, I think probably for the biggest stocks, the some of the largest stocks in the market, this is probably pretty, pretty uh, 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 difficult because, I think U.S. stock market, for instance, is like exceptionally concentrated, right? So, so if you think about, for instance, um, look, look at the concentration of the U.S. stock market. Uh, so this is the most recent year, you know, like five stocks basically account as 26% of the S&P 500, right? So, and, you know, I think even kind of over a very long period of time, 
uh, you know, it never really averages less than like uh, 15 or so percent. So I think kind of on the very top end of the market, right? Uh, when you think about basically how you think you can get, you know, some type of a, an instrument for those type of stocks, uh, uh, one I think has to account for 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 also this this uh, this 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 concentration. And if you sort of look at what's happening um, right now, if you just kind of Google, right? Uh, there's a lot of, because the fangs are so big, uh, there's a lot of discussions of ways of funds that you can buy to get fang exposure, right? You know, so like, you know, you can invest in the BlackRock investment and technology mandate to basically get the fangs. Uh, and and um, so I, I think that, you know, basically if this is an important enough effect, uh, the instrument P hat K, of course, is going to end up being correlated with, with, with EIK, the latent demand, at least uh, for, for kind of maybe the very high end of the market. Uh, the, the very largest stocks. And sort of in some of the stuff I've done with the Russell's, Russell indexing. So, I mean, obviously the Russell stuff is only the, the small stocks, right? The mid cap stocks. It doesn't really extend to basically the Russell 2 doesn't extend to, 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 to the very high end. Uh, and there, I think, you know, consistent with this paper, there was some increase in the impact over time with passive tracking, but I don't think the effects are nearly as big. I think, you know, the, the impact of passive tracking on these on, on the set of kind of these mid cap stocks over time, even as indexing, even as passive indexing has kind of gone up over a lot in the last 20 years, uh, we didn't see necessarily these, these huge effects. I mean, there was some effect consistent with this paper. Uh, so I think that kind of speaks to me that there's potential issues with, I think, kind of the, the instrument that, that um, at least kind of on the very high end. Um, so I, I guess kind of, you know, the, the, what, I, what I view as kind of the, the, the challenges. You know, I, I, I think that obviously this, this is like, you know, this, this paper is, is, is a hugely important paper. Uh, I, I think it completely, makes a lot of sense to try to connect basically these 13 up filings into uh, uh, um, you know kind of all of the various theories of asset pricing we have. I think this paper along with the KY paper are kind of two, two of the important papers to kind of take this important step. Uh, but but I, I would say that I think kind of you know uh, getting instruments for the large stocks is, 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 is pretty important. I think it's a lot, obviously a lot easier to get the instruments for the mid cap stocks. Uh, so, so I think that that's kind of one, one, one set of challenges. Uh, and I think kind of the other set of challenges is that, you know, it's not so obvious why you wouldn't want to also use information from the other tests of information efficiency, right? Because, you know, once you basically connect uh, uh, in, this, in this paper, connect basically the elasticities at the fund level, right? Uh, to, to kind of this informational view, this information acquisition view, or this competition view, uh, some of that also emerges at, 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 at the, uh, at the price level, so sort of like you know, obviously the the whether you do like a, a reversal test, whether you do a, a long long horizon, short horizon variance test, it's going to basically pick up uh, also information about this, this 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 structural parameter, and so there might be kind of scope to I think uh, a link essentially uh, these different types of tests. All right, so conclusion. I mean, it's obviously a very it's you know pretty easy to tell. It's a fantastic paper. Uh, uh, there's a lot of great ideas here, uh, uh, and and I think it opens up a lot of uh, uh, research pathways for, for, for the field. Uh, let me stop there. Um, uh, okay, thanks so much, Harrison. So uh, before asking uh, questions, Val, if you would like to uh, give answer Harrison comments. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, first, thanks, Harrison, for those thoughts. Like, it's really very insightful and makes us think a little bit more, and we we'll think we'll have to work more on this. Uh, I think what, what, one thing I'd say, though, is that <laughs> And that's the equation that you showed. Like, what makes price informativeness is a combination of two things in a way: is how elastic is the market, or how inelastic is the market, and how much noise trading we have going. On. And why? Why? And, and so it might be the, one way to reconcile those different findings is that it might just be that we have much less noise tra trading for large stock, even though investors are not adjusting their, their large stock position very much. Because actually, you know. I, I agree I'm a little bit puzzled and, and we've been actually a little bit puzzled for, to find such low estimate of elasticity for large stock. But I also want to say that it's not so surprising because if you think even a large fund that's close to an index fund, a big chunk of their portfolio will come from, um, will come from those large stock. And so adjusting your position by 1% of your total position in large stock is a huge change in your portfolio. That's just for small stocks, it's much easier to, to, to move your portfolio share, again, proportionally quite a bit. And so to me, I think it's not so surprising that, that the demand for those stocks is less elastic. The challenge, of course, is well, you know, why, why is there less trading in those stocks as well? And, and, and that, um, 
that is less clear in, in, in our, set, our setup is a little bit less well suited to try to think about where the noise comes from and, and what, what are the dynamics of the noise. The, the, uh, just to wrap up on this, I, I think your, your idea of like zooming in on, on large stocks in particular like, because they are so big and so important and maybe try to find different instruments for those large stocks, I think is great and, and uh, we'll definitely get to it. Uh, I, I think, uh, the, I mean, one nice thing of the demand system is that you can take all the stocks together and have very holistic estimation. And I, I think this is very valuable above and beyond standard kind of quasi-experimental ev evidence. But it feels like the large stocks are, don't quite fit completely into this, like, you know, the same as every other stock. So I agree that it could be a good idea to separate them. And, and we will definitely think about that. Um, okay, great. So guys, if you have any uh, further questions before I ask uh, the first question, uh, please don't forget to raise your hands or post your questions on chat. So on Nader, Rahelan, uh, uh, please go ahead with your question. Uh, I guess my question for Ralph is just, um, do 64 rebalancings and macro hedging impact the elasticity of markets? Uh, and then how does Slifer's X cap M uh, fit into uh, your model? For what's for me or for? Uh, uh, for you. For me. Oh, um, well, so, so if you have, I don't know, just, um, like, I guess it goes back to the question, like, why is demand inelastic in the first mm -hmm. place? And so one thing that generates sort of like fairly inelastic demand is that if you rebalance back to like fixed sort of proportions all the time, then you can sort of compute elasticities out of that. And those tend to be fairly low. Um, so, and if you're interested in that sort of like, you can uh, have a look at the paper that we have with Xavier Gebex, we sort of like explore some of those, some of those themes. Um, and, and so there we sort of like show how fixed rebalancing rules, how that impacts, impacts elasticities. Mm -hmm. 